Georgetown University and also the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C. I was uh, told by the organizers that uh, I would moderate a session in a small room with maybe 75 people, and it would be very participant intensive and interactive. A and now I feel like we're at a rock concert. Um, but it's great to be with all of you this afternoon. We have a terrific panel, and I think you have bios in your program. I won't give long introductions, um, at, but I will say something about each speaker in turn uh, as I introduce them. What we're going to do today is we're going to have introductory comments by each of our stellar speakers. Then I may indulge myself and ask a question or two, or even invite them to interact or two. You two can sit a little closer together. It looks hostile. It looks. Really? There we go. <laughs> okay. Not so far away, though, from your other colleagues. And, uh, I think it's and then there is ample really time for questions and comments from you. There is a microphone in the center aisle. And so when we get to that point, you're invited to queue up, and I'll call on you and get as many of you in as possible. The, the title of the panel uh, this afternoon is called The Israeli Athos, which could go in a number of different directions as we were discussing backstage. Um, a handful of years ago, I was living in Europe. I was based in Berlin. I was running something called the Aspen Institute Germany, and I was running a program to Israel with young European journalists, France, Greece, Italy, Germany. And uh, we would go to Israel, and we would have a range of meetings and appointments on everything under the sun, in addition to politics and foreign and security policy, innovation, technology, uh, social entrepreneurship, creative arts. A and respectfully, I, I have to say, many a young European journalist looks at Israel through, if I may maybe overstate for effect, through one lens. That is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is so very important. But one lens. So we would go down there and travel around the country for 10 days and have a range of meetings on all these topics, including aid and relief. And I had one European journalist, a German, say to me, you know, you could actually go on holiday in this place. I had another journalist, a, a French editor, say to me, you know, this is crazy. You could even study here. And then I had another European journalist from Britain say to me, this sounds wild, but I could imagine living here. Well, go figure. Um, it is an exceptionally diverse and vibrant and dynamic place. It has so much to offer in so many areas, including in innovation and social entrepreneurship, and economic aid, and development, and disaster relief, and they're great stories to be told. We're going to hear some today. Uh, I'm going to call on Savan, you first, if I may. Ladies first. All right. I told you it was like a rock concert, you know? You have a fan base, Sivan. This is getting exciting. Um, Savan Borovic Yari, founder and CEO, Innovation Africa, based uh, in New York, although she's based in Tel Aviv, uh, supplying, uh, uh, sharing Israeli solar, agriculture, water technologies with rural African villages in a number of countries in a very creative, sensible, responsible, and very helpful sort of way. Savan, it, it's really open right now. You can take us anywhere you want, but please take five, seven, eight, nine minutes to get us started, and welcome to you. Well, Jeff, thank you. And good afternoon to everyone, and thank you. I also expected a small room and to see so many of you, so thank you for taking the time. I'm going to tell you about Innovation Africa. I founded Innovation Africa 10 years ago with a very simple goal, to share and to bring Israeli technologies in water, solar, agricultural technologies to remote villages. I've been in Africa for 19 years, and I'm sure that some of you went to Africa, and you, are, you will agree with me that there are many, many challenges. But the more I traveled, and still traveling, I see that the main challenge in Africa, then and today, 
is the lack of energy. And that's the reason why Africa, in my opinion, is still in poverty. Now, I grew up poor in Israel, really. But compared to the poverty that we are seeing in Africa, it's different. Because there is no energy, people don't get access to vaccines and medicines in medical centers because there is no energy in medical centers, so no refrigeration. Because there is no energy, people can get good education. But the most challenging is that because there is no energy, people don't get access to water, clean water. And lately and before, we are seeing people searching for water. Yet, there is plenty of water right beneath their feet, a few meters deep in the aquifers. We just need a little bit of energy to pump the water. So what we've been doing for the past 10 years, quite simply, Israeli system, simple, cheap, we bring them to the villages, we install solar energy on medical centers to give light, we do the same at schools, and we use solar energy to pump water and install drip irrigation. Very, very simple, and the impact is tremendous. So, in 10 years, we have done 180 villages, we have helped over a million people, and we are working in eight African countries. And, and Jeff, I want people to know that the, the installation of the solar system is the easy part. What we do before is what takes time and is more important. It's to work with the government of each country because we have to meet with the ministers of water, energy, health, understanding where the government is not able to help, where there is no infrastructure and where we, as an NGO, can go and help. And then when we go deeper into the villages, we meet with the local government, the chief of the villages, the women association, and then we work with them. Now, the solar system installation only takes about two to three weeks, but working with the community in creating solar committee, where they have to elect from the villagers treasurer, president, open a bank account, so that we, our team at Innovation Africa, are helping them to use the energy and to use the water to create businesses, because they need money to replace light bulbs and they need money to replace the batteries. So together, we are building partnerships, helping them to empower themselves. Our modest contribution, really, is only sharing the technology. So our vision today, and I think we will get there, is to reach 1,000 villages by 2025, and so to provide water and electricity to 6 million people. And I think we will. <clears throat> And Jeff, with your permission, I want to conclude by saying that we cannot do it without people that have been great, and many of them are here actually at APAC. Bar Mitzvah, Bat Mitzvah, adapting villages, synagogue, adapting villages, corporations, churches, and then they travel with us to be there the day we install the solar panels and open the tap. By the way, it's priceless to see children looking at the light for the first time or drinking water. So the more we can have people adapting villages, traveling with us, being there, to see the face of the people you're impacting, it's important. And let me finish by saying, most of the people have never heard of Israel before. <laughs> when we get to the village and when we say we are from Israel, this is the first face of Israel they see, and they appreciate. And even at the government level, they do. So with all of the good that Israel is doing in this world, I think Israel deserves a better PR. So the more we can do, the more we can share, the more we can bring, the more it will be good for Israel. Thank you.
Uh, Savan, thank you. That's a wonderful beginning. I want to follow up with you with one question, which is really basic. So, as I understand, you were born in Israel. You grew up in France. Yes. You were educated in the United States. Um, but you bring to this something that all entrepreneurs, whether it's in business or social entrepreneurship, bring to their work. Ideas, but also a passion. Why Africa? There are many parts of this world ah. that are in need of help and attention and support. What was it in your life or business or background that connected you to Africa in such an important way? All right. Let me tell you how it all started. First and foremost, there was truly no reason for me being in Africa. No reason. I was born in Israel. As I told you earlier, my father couldn't find a job. He was unemployed for years. And he couldn't take care of the family. So when I was 12 years old, he told us, I'm sorry, we have to leave Israel. We moved to France. We moved to France. My parents couldn't find a job. So they opened the pizzeria. And they started selling pizza in the market. And Jeff, I'm not joking. After having pizza, every dinner, lunch, breakfast, and I was that big, I told my parents, I'm going to look for better nutrition. I went to the army in Israel as I volunteered. And after the army, I got lucky. And that's how I arrived to Africa. I was 20 years old. I'm in Israel. I'm looking for a job. And then somebody told me, go ask from this gentleman a job. He's the owner of Jordash jeans. Do you know Jordash <laughs> jeans? The jeans Jordash? <coughs> I don't know. That was 19 years ago. And I went to him and I said, excuse me, do you have a job for me? And he said, well, you're lovely, which I was, but... No, I was. But... <laughs> no. I, but your English is not good. And then I told him, I speak French. He said, oh, if you speak French, I have a job for you. I own a factory in Madagascar where they speak French, where we do jeans, go and do quality control. I said, Madagascar, where it is? He said, it's in Africa. And this is how, at the age of 20, I got to Africa. And, and as I told you earlier, the more I traveled, the more I saw poverty, real poverty. And that's really when I realized that the solutions are so simple. And Israel has the solution. That's what we, the Jews, used to pump water in the Negev <laughs> and to make who we are today. So uh, again, the, the modest contribution that Israel can do to this world and be a light into the nation is to just share, share what we have so we can make other people stronger. That's it. Thank you very much. I was, uh, I was about to say, ladies and gentlemen, the next Prime Minister of Israel. Um, but this is not a political panel. Um, Avi, can I turn to you next, sure. please? Um, you, you have, uh, here in the United States, served in the Defense Department, the Treasury Department, you've written for the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times, and many other newspapers and publications. Um, and you have a brand, I think it's a brand new book out, 2018, you can't beat that, red hot. Came out on uh, Friday, actually. Pardon me? Came out on Friday. Came brand out new. on Friday. This is a book party, okay? Y you don't know the title yet. Unless you've read it, don't applaud. You might not like it. But you will like it. It's called Thou Shalt Innovate, How Israeli Ingenuity Repairs the World. Um, I, I once read, a, I thought it was pretty good, a definition of entrepreneur. It said, uh, an individual who generates ideas for which the technology and infrastructure probably doesn't exist yet and the capital hasn't been allocated. It's an ideas industry, ingenuity. Ingenuity. Tell us, you can talk about whatever you want to talk about, but please tell us about the book. Okay. So the germination of this book, first of all, I want to thank my fellow panelists. I really am the fish out of water here. As I walked up, Tom says to me, I know the ambassador, I know Sivan. What are you doing here? <laughs> so my, my journey with technology really began in the, in the summer of 2014 when I had I also recognized Nati Barak, who's the head of uh, Netaf, who's the chief sustainability officer of Netafim, who's sitting in the crowd, an amazing Israeli innovation when it comes to water, which is used throughout Africa. Um, my journey began with tech, 
in the summer of 2014 when my family and I lived through the war in 2014 and found protection in the Iron Dome. And I was extraordinarily depressed on the one hand as I looked around the Middle East and saw Syria was going into civil war, Iraq was really a bad place, Sinai, Lebanon, nothing, no, no good news there. But I, was, I found the Iron Dome really protected my family's life as we were running in and out of bomb shelters. And also, frankly, I kept on meeting amazing innovators like these three here and realized, wow, Israel is creating technology that is influencing the lives of billions of people around the world. It's taking its greatest commodity, its brain power, and improving the lives of billions of people when it comes to water, solar, aid, your development agency. Unbelievable the lives that it is improving. And so like Saul Senor and Dan Senor before me, I read Startup Nation and realized, wow, Israel's a small country, enemies galore, not so many natural resources, but it has more startups combined than Canada, India, Japan, and, India, and, and the United Kingdom combined, and has more companies on the NASDAQ than any other country outside of North America? That's impressive. Where does this ethos come from? And I started to dig in. And people say, if you look at the expert, they say, mix a little bit of universities, chutzpah, diversity, the military, and voila, you've got the startup nation. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of countries that have great militaries. So where does this come from? And I started looking around. I asked all the innovators. I, frankly, I started writing a book and interviewing all the innovators I could find and realized, where does this come from? And it comes back down to the Jewish DNA, the genetic DNA of the Jewish people. It's a universal yearning to make the world a better place. Since the Middle Ages, and probably earlier than that, three times a day religious Jews have been praying for tikkun olam and making the world a better place. We believe we have a social contract with God to make the world a better place, spread morality and social justice. The Mishnah, since the second century AD, codified into law saying, for the sake of those less advantaged than you, you must repair the world. The prophet Isaiah encouraged us to become a light onto the nations. And at the heart of all of Jewish history is this idea that we are obligated to turn the mundane into the holy. Every Saturday night when my family does Havdalah, we say, Hamavdil ben Kodesh lechol, to separate the, the mundane from the holy. That is at the center of Jewish history, whether you're religious or not. We have for 3,000 years been trying to elevate the mundane and make it holy. And as you look around at these unbelievable innovators, they represent the best of Israel. G.K. Chesterton, a great British explorer in the 19th century wrote, America is a country with the soul of a synagogue. He basically seemed to say that America had the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights, and this is a pretty special place. I've come to believe that Israel has the soul of a synagogue, that it's basically the prophetic tradition that we have been following for 3,000 years, religious or not religious, for 3,000 years, is driving and fostering a very, very innovative culture. Here you have one of the smallest countries in the world trying to solve some of the largest problems. Look at just the people to my left and to my right. You have the ambassador who's, who's the head of an, a very small, tiny development agency if you compare it to the United States. And yet, four or five years before the United States started its own development agency, Mashav was started. If you look at Sivan Yaari, she basically talked about water and solar technology. Israel is the only country in the world to have declared water independence. In 2013, it said, we're no longer dependent on our neighbors. We're no longer dependent on the weather. We have a water surplus, and it's in large part because of someone like Nati Barak, where you have drip irrigation. Basically, drip irrigation uses a third of the water and doubles the yield for farmers all over the world. That particular innovation is helping billions of people around the world. If you look at solar energy, that one solar panel was created by Harry Tzvi Tabor in 1956. That one solar panel is now helping billions of people around the world, and it doesn't stop there. Look at, for example, Eli Beer, who you'll find somewhere running around. He created United Hatzalah. 
United Atsala uses, it's an Uber for emergency responders. Beep, beep, beep. Jeff, if you were to have a heart attack today, right here, right now, God forbid, what would I do? <laughs> yeah. Someone would call 911. And 21 minutes later, which is the national average of the United States, an ambulance would come. Guess what? You'd probably be dead. Encouraging. <laughs> but what is encouraging? No, it's an amazing <laughs> Think about yeah, it. Yeah, what is encouraging, Javi? Go ahead and complete United that thought. United did two things. One, created something called an ambucycle, right? An ambucycle, which is half ambulance, half motorcycle, and a crowdsourcing application, that's Uber, for the closest EMT. He'd come running to save Jeff, to save his life. The national average in the United States, 21 minutes for an, am for an ambulance to arrive. In Israel, an emergency responder, three minutes. <clears throat> and in most major cities, 90 seconds. Jeff would all likelihood be saved. So when you look at the heart and soul of the state of Israel, this is it. Israel is a complicated place. We are not a nation of saints. We're not. We have our problems. But this is at the heart and soul of the state of Israel. And these three people next to me, Israel had a great example. Look at the aid that they have delivered all over the world. Leveraging Israeli technology. Israel is taking its greatest commodity, its innovativeness, and helping the lives of billions of people. There's no single narrative that defines the state of Israel. But there is no denying that it has extraordinary innovators that are sitting to my right and to my left that are bound together not by religion, money, or stature. I don't know how much the ambassador makes, but not enough. Sivan runs a nonprofit. So does Yotam. They are not bound together by a desire to make money, religion, or stature. No. These people here are bound together by the desire to save lives and make the world a better place. And that is the heart of the State of Israel. Uh, Avi, th thank you. That, that was terrific. Um, I'm going to ask you one question. First of all, I'm going to suggest that for the remainder of this panel, we have no more illustrations involving a potentially dead moderator. <laughs> Leaving that aside. <laughs> Avi, Don't why, worry, Ellie's uh, running around. Why, <laughs> why is it that I, I, I think that, that I heard Sivan say, or anyway, I'm going to quote her as having said, that, that Israel is not particularly good at telling its story in this way. Um, because there's a fabulous, plural, stories in this realm to tell. Why is that? Why is, if you agree with that proposition, wh why is Israel running a deficit in the narrative marketing story area where there's so much to tell in the area of idealism and passion and, as you said, working to make the world a better place? That is a wonderful question. And that that is the reason why I wrote my book, Thou Shalt Innovate. I felt like there was not enough good stories being told. But I look to each and every one of you here at APAC. You, I appoint you here and now, ambassadors of the State of Israel. Go forth and tell this amazing story. Go out and talk to your friends. Talk to your family. Talk to your members of Congress. Tell them, when you lobby your members of Congress on Tuesday, you tell them a few things. One, Israel is a country that is taking its innovative prowess and saving lives and making the world a better place. One. Two, tell them that Israel is not only a taker. Israel is an unbelievable giver when it comes to this great innovation, when it comes to water, when it comes to solar, when it comes to aid, when it comes to its development all over the world. <clears throat> when you give to Israel, Israel gives back. And it's up to you to live that story. Go to Israel, feel that story. Come up to Yotam, speak to Sivan, meet the ambassador, talk to them, get their stories, go to Israel. Tell this unbelievable story. This, this is not only an Israel story. It is a universal yearning. Israel has Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And they're all involved in this unbelievable story. Let's take, for example, the emergency bandage, which is standard issue in the United States military throughout Europe and other places. It saved the life, of example, of Gabby Giffords. Yeah? But the, the factory that creates it is in the northern part of Israel. 
It's owned by a Muslim Bedouin man who employs 50 women. Israel is, is a very, very diverse culture. Tell your friends and your family. This is an unbelievable story. Read my book. <laughs> Buy it on Amazon. But truly, this is the story of the state of Israel. There's lots of stories, but this is at its heart and its soul. <clears throat> Avi, thank you very much. Yotam, may I go to you next, please? You, you are um, in action on the ground in the field. You're a CEO. You're leading um, a, a relief mission agency involved, I think, in 22 countries. You yourself have been involved in a number of relief actions around the world. T tell us whatever's on your mind, but I am, one of the themes that's come up here today is this uh, striking idea that a small, relatively small country with a relatively small population, with relatively minor, in the scale of things, resources, can play such a large, powerful role. We think about big countries, big budgets, big agencies, but not so. Yeah, I think, I think that our size is actually our advantage. Um, when you look at the aid world right now, and I personally have been to the tsunami in Japan, the Ebola outbreak, the Syrian refugee crisis, the earthquake in Nepal, all the major natural and man-made disasters of the last decade um, that Israel has been involved in, um, you know, you see big organizations that are coming with a huge logistical, bureaucratic operation. Um, you know, we always, I always compare that um, when Haiti happened, um, the Red Cross, and I'm not here to criticize the Red Cross, but they came with about 2,000 people. And we came with six. And, um, and that just to mobilize 2,000 people, this large operation was very hard. And, and that's how Israel, both the IDF and Israel, was able to operate probably the most successful field hospital in Haiti. In Nepal, um, one of the most dramatic stories that we have, I was there um, 36 hours after the earthquake. And I used to live in Nepal for three years, so I speak Nepalese, which is a language that I didn't think would be useful. But when we, uh, when we went to the uh, earthquake in Nepal, we had a small, a relatively small 15 uh, members rescue team from Israel. And again, there were teams from all over the world and they were trying to organize and they didn't know how to coordinate it. And I somehow knew the uh, chief of the Nepalese army. So I asked him um, if he still think we can find any survivors. And he said we don't really have a chance, according to his sources. But he pointed out this one building that used to be a five-story hotel. And according to his sources, there were still 22 people buried under the rubbles. And we went there with this very small team, very small, very dynamic team that didn't have too much, you know, uh, equipment to carry. We carried something very small that's called a life detector. And what's a life detector? It's a very small and, and sophisticated microphone that could recognize heartbeats and human breath. And we were digging into the rubbles, and for the first two days, and I, and I forgot to mention that this whole digging and rescue operation only started in the fourth day after the earthquake. So it was very late, and because we know the chances of finding survivors after 72 hours are really you know, close to zero. So we're digging into the rubbles, and we started to pull out dead bodies. Fortunately, we couldn't find anyone alive. So in the first day, we pulled out 12 dead bodies. In the following day, we pulled out additional nine. So a total of 21 people. But we heard from the local community and, and the chief of the army that there were 22 people there under the rubbles. So we asked, and they told us there was one person who was still missing, and that lady was a lady named Krishna Kumari, who was 35 years old. She had two children, and she was the cleaning lady in this <coughs> hotel before the earthquake. And when we were finally able to dig about 15 meters deep into the rubble, we used this life detector. And the, and the commander of our chief was listening with these massive headphones, and he told me he hears something. He wasn't sure. He said it could be a cat, it could be some bricks moving, but it could actually be this last survivor. And he asked me to do something really weird. He asked if I could crawl into this hole, into these rubble, and, and scream something in Nepalese, because he knew I spoke the language. 
Um, and of course, I was terrified because I knew that, you know, if I move my hand in the wrong direction, the whole thing could collapse, not only on me, but on the rescue team behind me and potentially this last survivor. So when I, when I um, went into this hole and I reached the, sort of the deepest point that I saw, I screamed something in Nepalese. Um, and it goes like, it might sound a bit weird to you, it goes like, Yaha koko hununcha. Yaha koko hununcha. Sounds like gibberish, right? Um, it's, it's, it's actually a bit of a funny story because I was telling this story at, uh, at a college in Boston and one of the students started to laugh. And everyone looked at her, why are you laughing? It's such a dramatic story. And she was Nepalese. <laughs> so she understood what I was saying. And, and the truth is what I wanted to say was, is there anybody in there? But I was so overwhelmed and stressed with the situation, so I ended up saying something like, uh, excuse me, is there anybody in there? <laughs> no, it was way too polite, <laughs> completely inappropriate. <laughs> and um, no, but really, um, uh, it's, it's really one of these stories of miracle, because unbelievably down from the bottom, not only that we were able to recognize a movement with this life detector, but this lady was actually able to make a sound and she was whispering the word Dukcha. Dukcha. Dukcha in English means it hurts. I'm in pain. And, um, and she survived for 130 hours. She was the last survivor wow. of the Nepalese earthquake. She survived without food or water. And after a very long operation, and then we, uh, we sent it to the Israeli field hospital, and they treated her. And after two months, she actually she finally went back to the village with her two children. Um, and she's still alive and healthy today. So, thank you. Um, so I, so I, think, I think going back to your question, this is really our advantage. Our advantage is being very mobile, very hands-on, um, with a lot of chutzpah. I mean, we talk about chutzpah all the time. Um, but chutzpah in our world, in the humanitarian aid world, means that we go there, we, we try to understand what's going on, but, but we don't wait too much because that's the only way we could stay alive. Another story that I have is actually from the Syrian refugee crisis. So another small Israeli technology that we use all the time is WhatsApp. You know, a very simple app that I'm sure everyone here uses. What I was surprised to find out is actually that not only we use WhatsApp, the Syrian refugees, they all use WhatsApp. And every time a boat full of Syrian refugees came to Greece, to Lesbos, where we provided them with medical care, we, we handed out a map that we translated in Arab because we have a big team of Arab Israelis. And, um, and they, they pulled out the smartphone from their shirt and they literally had nothing but the clothes they were. And they opened Google Maps and, and they looked at the, at the map. And, but one day we got a message on WhatsApp from other volunteers that a Syrian pregnant lady arrived on the shore. Now, our volunteers that day was Iris, who is an Israeli Jewish doctor, and Malek, who is a Bedouin Muslim nurse from Beersheba. And they didn't take it too seriously because they seen thousands of pregnant women uh, arriving. They thought she's probably four or five months pregnant. So they texted back on WhatsApp, how far is she? The volunteer from the other side immediately called them screaming. He says, I can see the head. That's how far she is. So they rushed there, they, they conducted the delivery, uh, and thank God, Baruch Hashem, the baby is healthy. And after a few months, when the family made it to Germany, which was their final destination, they sent a text message again on WhatsApp to Iris, our Israeli doctor, and they told her that she's like the second mother um, of, their, of her son. So I think this is sort of the Israeli spirit in terms of aid, in terms of innovation, and in terms of being really hands-on on the ground. Right. Gautam, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was another splendid presentation. I, I have a number of things I want to ask you. I'm going to restrain myself because we need to hear from one more of our fellow panelists and we have to get the audience in. Gil, thank you for waiting patiently, Ambassador. Uh, you are Deputy Director of a Development Cooperation Agency in the Israeli Foreign Ministry. You've been a career diplomat for 25 years. You've been posted to a half a dis dozen different uh, African countries, you've been ambassador to Kenya. Um, you've heard a lot. Um, pick up wherever you like and okay. lead us wherever you wish right now. Bill, okay, please. thank you. Thank you, Jeff, very much. Uh, just to clarify, I'm the director of Mashav, 
the Israeli Agency for International Development Cooperation and the Israeli Aid Agency. And I'm Deputy Director of the Foreign Ministry. So just to, to clarify. And, and since uh, Avi brought my um, uh, paycheck to the table, let me tell you that an Israeli civil servant is also a non-profit organization on its own. So just to, clarify, just, just to clarify that. Um, you know, the topic of this um, um, very interesting gathering is the Israeli ethos. And I'm, I'm asking myself, what is the Israeli uh, uh, ethos to, to talk about? And uh, when Sivan uh, told her story about how she went into <coughs> Africa and that inspired her to do what she's doing, uh, this reminds me of another great Israeli lady who went into Africa and came back to Israel and was inspired by that visit, and that is uh, Golda Meir, the former, <laughs> that's to Sivan, former uh, Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Israel. And um, I think when we tell the story of Golda Meir and the way she established Mashav, that is the Israeli ethos, and I'll explain why. She traveled to Africa uh, after consulting with David Ben Gurion in 1957. And she came back to Israel in December 1957. And she approached the Prime Minister and told him, Mr. Prime Minister, I saw great misery in Africa. I saw great misery in the communities. I saw great misery within the African women population. We have to do something in order to assist them. We're talking about December 1957. Israel is nine years old. Israel is a nation of refugees who have still not been settled properly in, its, in their own country. Israel is a country in a state of economic austerity. We did not have eggs or milk. We had egg powder, which I believe is an Israeli, another in innovative uh, invention. <laughs> We had milk powder, and they were rationed to the people of Israel. And there you have the two main leaders at the time debating among themselves, do we establish a development aid agency in 1957? And their immediate answer was yes, and they established Mashav. This was, as was mentioned, before the establishment of USAID, before the establishment of UNDP, the main development uh, arm of the United Nations, and well before most of the Western nations development agencies, and I think that's incredible. And I think that corresponds to the ethos of the Jewish people and the Israeli people. And Mashav started off as a very small fraction in the foreign ministry, in the bureau of the foreign minister. Today we are full-fledged division within the foreign ministry and it is part and parcel of Israeli mainstream diplomacy. When we go into Africa, when we go into Latin America, when we go into Central Asia and Southeast Asia with a diplomatic mission, in our toolbox as diplomats, we have this tool of aid and development. And we approach every single leader and up to today, uh, uh, in more than 140 countries, and we, the first question we ask, before we tell them what we want for them, from them uh, in return, the first question that we will ask, this is me, and this includes also Prime Minister, what can we do as Israel to help in addressing your challenges? I accompanied Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, less than a year ago to Monrovia, Liberia, and in the span of nine hours, we met 11 African leaders. And every single meeting started off with the Prime Minister telling him, Mr. President, how can we assist you? And this goes down, I think, to uh, this, uh, uh, the Israeli cause and the Israeli ethos, because Israel is a country challenged with immense diplomatic challenges, and you all know that, and this has been discussed uh, widely in this conference and other conferences. But still, we do not condition our aid, we don't condition our development activity, we are willing to exercise development to any single country in the world, regardless of diplomatic relations, including a uh, twice uh, approaching Iran to assist 
in humanitarian crisis after earthquakes. Of course, they were uh, um, declined, but we don't uh, think twice before we approach any country on this planet to assist, to, to offer our assistance. Up until today, the official um, uh, aid of Israel trained more than 300,000 trainees from 140 countries. And I think that's an incredible number when you look at the number of inhabitants in the state of Israel. And the main message that we bring to these countries is that anything that has been done in Israel in the past 70 years since our existence can be duplicated in your countries. Everything is doable. If we grow vegetables and 80% of the vegetable export of Israel comes out of desert soil without any rainfall, this can be duplicated in Africa, in Latin America, in the deserts of Central Asia, or in the uh, uh, tropical, uh, non-hospitable uh, climate of uh, Southeast Asia. And I think that spirit that we bring with us in these deliberations, bilateral, multilateral, uh, um, uh, doesn't matter the scale, that is something that is highly appreciated on the international scene. And I've been asked, I don't know how, long, how much time we'll have uh, to the audience to ask questions, but I've been asked before, uh, does this correspond with the uh, uh, diplomatic reaction that Israel receives back from many countries. So I can tell you on the bilateral level, a big yes. We have excellent bilateral relations with almost all countries in the world, definitely countries that uh, are, uh, are defined as developing countries. On the multilateral level, the challenge is, is immense. This is, I think, a, a different topic to be discussed but we don't measure the level of our relations with countries on the multilateral, but yet on the bilateral. And development uh, our relations, the Israeli ethos, is a part and parcel of these relations, and uh, we intend to continue for the next 60 years as well. Great. Gil, thank you very much. An equally outstanding contribution, and I think we have lots to uh, mull and ask about and comment on. So there is a microphone in the middle of this center aisle. I, yes, sir, you're right on target there. So you're welcome to, to join him. Um, I think it would be great to get as many in as possible. So we'll take two or three. We'll bundle them together at a time. Yes. If you would tell us who you are, and, and if all of you could be disciplined in deference to your fellow audience members and ask one question, and it's not permitted to say I have one question in five parts. You have the floor. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chinedu. Um, I'm from California. I'm an international student from Nigeria. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank Sevan. Uh, I saw a video um, of what you do last year, and it was really impressive, and I really do want to thank you. And so my question is really simple. Um, what's the advice you have for young Africans uh, in helping develop our nations um, in conjunction or with the help and partnership of Israel and by passing politicians as much as possible? Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Simone, hold your fire on that. We're going to take a couple more, and then we'll come right back to you. Thank you, sir, very much. We're going to go to the gentleman standing right behind you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eitan. I'm a college student from Illinois. Um, thank you. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, so we on campus really like to promote all of Israel's great innovation, humanitarian work around the world. And a lot of the pushback we get from anti-Israel organizations is saying that we are using these, uh, these great things about Israel to whitewash the occupation or whitewash um, war crimes, alleged war crimes from Israel. So I'd like to know if you guys have faced the same pushback in your professional work and what advice you have for us as student activists uh, on how we can counter that. Great. Thank great you. Question. Let's uh, take one more and then we'll give a chance for the panel to respond, they'll go to another round. Yes, please. Oh, are you first? Okay. 
Um, hi, I'm Zoe. I'm a high school student from South Florida. And um, I was wondering if any of you, um, if somebody like me, um, you know, a high school student or perhaps a college student who's really interested in something like medicine or just like humanitarian aid, um, how we can get involved at this young age in one of your organizations or in another organization you know um, that basically, you know, within, in Israel um, or in another country that you guys work with, how we can get involved hands on ourselves. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Zoe. Savan, would you like to lead off, please? Yes. First so, question was directed to you. Yes, so first I would like to say thank you for first watching the video and for the compliment. We're not yet in Nigeria. We are now only operating in eight African countries, but in the countries where we operate, we are looking for the youth to get involved and we are training people. Most of what we do from the Israel office we create, develop, and all of our engineers, we are going to the countries where we operate and we train locals, especially young people, and teach them about solar and water and they work with us, so they are the one, and we pay them salaries, full-time staff. We have over 50 engineers per country now operating. And so if I was in Nigeria, I will tell you to come and work with us, but on another way, Mashav, I know, is welcoming so many people from around the country, and I'm sure also from Nigeria, to come for two to three weeks, and I'm sure Gil can say more, to come learn about all the agricultural technologies and everything that we have learned here in Israel, so that when you go back, you can share it with your country. So I know Mashav is doing so much about that. Svan, thank you. That, that's a great answer. Uh, let's go to the second one, the, the, the young gentleman from Illinois who said that he hears on campus, I think he was on campus, from anti-Israeli groups, you're talking about all these good, wonderful things because you don't want to talk about difficult things. Who wants, you're oh, leaning oh, in. Oh, okay. Yo, Tom, you want to take that one? <clears throat> so um, uh, it's a great question. Um, personally, with, uh, for us at Israel, we've been to about 60 campuses just in the last year. Uh, we're doing a lot of campus events. And I have to tell you, first of all, there wasn't a single event that we received any kind of backlash with BDS. And I think the main reason um, is not because they don't want to criticize that, but it's hard to criticize real work. And when they realize that this is not a propaganda, that this is real long-term humanitarian aid, and you heard about it also not only from Israel, but also from Innovation Africa, Mashav, and other great organizations that are doing it not just as a Hasbara, actually doing it long-term with communities, building capacities of the local communities, the local government. Um, I think it's harder to criticize. I can tell you personally that for us, um, we have about 120 staff and volunteers who are Arab Israelis or Palestinian citizens of Israel. And they actually go to campuses and speak uh, about the work that they've done with Israel um, for, the, uh, for the Syrian refugees. Um, the latest program that we started, and we have a few people here in the audience, are representative of a program that we call the Israel Humanitarian Fellowship, where we actually, and that might answer also the third question, where we bring college students to the 21 countries where we work. They go for two months hands-on, fully paid internship in the summer, and then when they go back to campus, they are committed to one year of activities that are not a Hasbara for the state of Israel or for the government of Israel, or even for Israel. They're actually the ambassadors of the communities where they work for the Syrian refugees, or in East Africa, or in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, so first of all, there are opportunities to get involved. And I have to say, when you present real work and real impact, um, it's pretty easy, it's pretty hard, sorry, for the BDS uh, and others to fight it. Good, thank you. I'd like to just I'll follow be... up on that. Um, so let's just assume that you have a, uh, a student or students 